Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the Devil. Whatever name he's called by, the character is one of the most notorious biblical figures throughout the Christian world. Today we find Satan depicted in art, music, movies, and literature, sometimes taking the form of an angel, other times taking his more famous form of a horned beast with a spear-like tail. A 2007 poll found that 62% of Americans believe in the existence of a literal devil, which is 20% more than the number of Americans who were found to believe in the theory of evolution. There is a great deal of lore and mythology surrounding the figure of Satan, and not only is most of it absent from the Bible, but scripture even presents a contradictory picture to some common portraits of the great deceiver. In this video, we will explore the origins of Satan and expose some of the myths that have developed around the character. The word Satan is actually not a name, but a title. In Hebrew, Satan means adversary, and the word is often accompanied by the definite article ha, which in English is the. We find such a usage ten times in the book of Job, for example, where Satan is quite literally referred to as the adversary, which likely denotes how the figure in the text takes on the role of a prosecutor against Job. This raises problems for the view of Satan as a single supernatural being, and matters are complicated by the existence of other passages that speak not of the adversary, but an adversary. Numbers 22.22 tells of how an angel of God stood in the path of a man named Balaam and prevented him from passing on his way. The Hebrew text calls this figure Malach Yahweh, or a messenger from God, and also states that the messenger acts as Le Satan, or an adversary to Balaam. Other passages mention Hadad the Edomite as an adversary to Solomon, and even the Israelite King David as an adversary to the Philistines. But in Numbers 22.22, we have something especially important, because it reveals that the use of the word Satan does not imply an evil or immoral being. The angel in the passage is sent from God to do good, by stopping Balaam from taking a reckless path. This puts a different light on the meaning of adversary in ancient Hebrew scripture. Instead of a being that is intent on ruining humans and defying the authority of God, the adversary appears to be an agent of God that is used for the purpose of opposing a human, by serving as an obstacle, or by subjecting the person to some sort of trial. The agent seems to have no personal hatred against its targets, but merely carries out God's will. Note the interesting difference in reaction to the adversary in the book of Job, where no admonishment is given, and Luke 4, where Jesus rebukes Satan by telling him that God is not to be tested. Why would God accept and approve of the adversary's challenge in Job, but then reject and scold the adversary's challenge in Luke's gospel? The simple answer is that, in Job, the adversary was not the evil opposer of God that he is in the gospels. How did the adversary come to be known as a single supernatural enemy of God? In her book, The Origin of Satan, religion professor Elaine Pagels observes that the ancient Israelites had begun personifying their enemies as evil cosmic forces even before the adversary became the notorious Satan that we think of today. In the book of Isaiah, Israel's foreign enemies are portrayed as the mythological creatures called Leviathan and Rahab, who will be punished by God. Later Hebrew texts show the adversary transitioning into a more sinister role, representing opposition to God and even treachery among Israelites. This transition, Pagels explains, came to a new prominence during the Maccabean Revolt, where Jews in favor of Hellenism clashed against those opposing the foreign king and desiring to preserve their Israelite heritage. More radical than their predecessors, these dissidents began increasingly to invoke the Satan to characterize their Jewish opponents. In the process, they turned this rather unpleasant angel into a far grander and far more malevolent figure. No longer one of God's faithful servants, he begins to become what he is for Mark and for later Christianity, God's antagonist, his enemy, even his rival. But what about the serpent in the garden and the war in heaven? Don't these allude to Satan as a distinct being? The problem is that when separated from the influence of the New Testament, the Hebrew scriptures that contain these stories look quite different. Genesis 3 says nothing about Satan being the serpent. In fact, it identifies the serpent as an animal which God had made. The serpent is only explicitly recognized as Satan in Revelation 12.9. The war in heaven with the mention of the angels being thrown down to earth is also found for the first time in this passage. Many of the other things we often associate with Satan come from Paradise Lost, Dante's Inferno, and the pseudepigraphal text The Life of Adam and Eve. The name Lucifer comes from an interpretation of Isaiah 14.12-15. 
The passage speaks of someone called the Morning Star and Son of the Dawn, who had supposedly been cast out of heaven for trying to become like God. Writing in the 3rd century CE, Origen was the first to claim that Satan is the Morning Star, and thus the name Lucifer originated for the devil's pre-fall identity, as it means light-bearer in Latin. However, this interpretation of Isaiah 14 has many problems, because the third verse makes it very clear that the Morning Star is a king of Babylon. The remarks about the figure raising his throne above the stars of God and then falling from heaven to earth conjure up images of the Tower of Babel, a story likely based on the mass of ziggurats the ancient Babylonians were known for building. The later prophecy against the Philistines in verse 28 appears to confirm that the text is literally speaking of the Babylonians, not metaphorically referencing Satan's army of angels or anything of the sort. One further issue is the fact that Jesus is even called the Morning Star in Revelation 22:16. Another Old Testament passage often interpreted as a reference to Satan is Ezekiel 28:12 through 19 which describes a person who is perfect in beauty and wisdom, who was in the Garden of Eden, but was then cast out due to pride. Like the Isaiah passage, this one specifically names its subject, who is the king of Tyre in this case, and the subsequent prophecy against Sidon in verse 20 makes this unlikely to be a metaphor for Satan. What's more is that verse 2 plainly states that the king of Tyre is a mere mortal who has lost God's favor because he came to see himself as a god after amassing a fortune and wealth thanks to the great trading skills of the people of Tyre. Only divorcing this passage from its context can make it refer to Satan. The name Beelzebub is commonly understood to mean Lord of the Flies. It occurs in 2 Kings 1 where the Israelite king Ahaziah commands his messengers to consult Beelzebub, the god of the Philistine city of Ekron. Yahweh is not pleased with this and sends Elijah to deliver a message to Ahaziah which ends in the king's death. The association of this name with Satan comes from Mark 3.22, where a crowd of religious teachers accuse Jesus of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub, who is said to be the prince of demons. However, scholars today believe Beelzebub is an intentional corruption of the name of a real Philistine deity named Baal Zabul. According to some, the original name means Baal the prince, while others think it was Lord of the High Place, or Lord of Heaven. Thus the name Beelzebub is an insulting play on the deity's name, designed to imply that the god is basically crap and its followers like flies. It's a good thing Christians no longer show such disrespect for other religions, isn't it? The history of Satan and art is a fascinating but difficult subject to trace to any specific points of origin. The Bible never gives a description of Satan's physical appearance, but because of the association with angels, many have drawn a connection to the description of the cherubim found in the book of Ezekiel. In the text, a cherub is depicted as a creature with four wings, human hands under each wing, and the faces of a lion, ox, eagle, and a human. This bizarre combination of animal features may have served for some of the early renditions of Satan as part man and part beast, with the horns of the ox or the wings of an eagle, for example. The book of Revelation, because it associates Satan with the serpent and also with a dragon, is likely responsible for the bat wings, claws, and pointed tail of the devil. Although this is speculation, it's certainly not inconceivable that early Christian artists would have used such passages in their depictions of Satan. The old adversary of Job is no longer the faithful servant of God who carries out divine prosecution, but the epitome of hatred, blasphemy, and immorality. Though many Christians warn that Satan was once an angel of light who may still appear in that beautiful form, it is believers themselves who have, throughout history, transformed the adversary from an agent of God to the defiant enemy of God. In a symbolic sense, Satan has taken on the sins of humanity and been reborn anew, as a scapegoat for God, human beings, and the world itself.